Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. Woo-hoo! I'm Justin Burke, joined tonight by Sydney Angel, joined tonight by the trusty Dr. Chris the Chew Manchu. Sydney, trusty. Chris, how are we doing tonight? Wonderful. Doing good. <laughs> uh, amazing. Great to have everyone together. We had a great episode tonight. Return guest, Dr. Craig Rohan, our dermatology expert, taking a deep dive on various hypopigmentation deep. disorders. It's follow up to the tinea. Um, but before we dive into the content, hey, Chris, can you tell us about the show? Sure. We are the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the fields to bring you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. We have another fantastic conversation with Dr. Craig Rohan, who is a dermatologist and pediatrician at Wright State University, where he was also recently appointed director of the Pharmacology Translation Unit. Mm -hmm. Prior to joining Wright State, Dr. Rohan served for 24 years as a physician in the U.S. Air Force. He has been fortunate to have been awarded multiple teaching awards during the course of his career, and we are thrilled to have him back as our on-call Cashlack dermatologist. That's right. Dr. Rohan builds on the past episode of Tinea, talking about broadening the differential, teaching us the approach to hypopigmented spots, talking about treating pityriasis alba, discussing the connection between vitiligo and thyroid disease, going through the long list of super rare diagnoses that can be associated with some of those severe hypopigmented disease that you don't want to miss but are pretty uncommon. High yield episode. Chris, what did you think? This is the episode not to miss. I mean, if you listen to any other hypopigmentation episode, it will pale in comparison. That's pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Dr. Craig Rohan, welcome back to the show. This is part two of our dermatology series for 2023. Welcome <laughs> back. Excited to see you. No, oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. This is great. We're doing kind of back-to-back episodes but in case people didn't listen to the last episode, or in case between now and when we actually release these, there's episodes in between, we don't know the exact release schedule. Can you remind us, give the listeners a little bit of a reminder who you are, give us a one-liner to describe yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Craig Rowan. I'm a, derma- I'm a pediatric dermatologist and dermatologist uh, out at Wright State University, which is uh, Dayton, Ohio. And I do about uh, about 40% of my practice is pediatrics and pediatric clinical trials, Maybe 40% are dreaded adults with overlap skin conditions that kids get to. And then 20% is some combination of academics, research, uh, meetings, that kind of thing. So, we're very med you know, friendly around here. You know, I some say med people are the best, but might you know, be. we, might be. we're, we're, not, we're <laughs> impartial. We... We just report the facts. Now, the man. thing is, I don't, I don't have the med side. So I did a peds residency and then I did a derm residency. So I guess if you count like 1998 uh, internal medicine uh, med school rotation. So, but yeah, med peds. I'll, I'll, I'll Honorary med peds. Well, yeah, good. welcome. Happy to have you. So Craig, I've known you for many years now, and I've known you since I was a, a junior faculty member, and you were well, well established and, and well respected. Yeah, I, I think I was pretty junior <laughs> too. But that's that's nice of you to and say. And I, I remember always at gatherings and things that you would always give me like really great because I was uh, also a. a not only was I a junior faculty, I was also a, a young parent. And you already had several kids by the time we met. And you would always give me like such great advice about like parenting and things like that. Um, I was wondering like if you could give, you know, one, you know, one, one piece of advice to physicians, providers out there who are also parents, what type of advice would you give them? Huh, one piece of advice. I mean, there's some simple stuff that I would give to like everyone, which is like obvious. And I, I don't want to echo things that come up on crib ciders all the time. But, you know, I mean, like being snobby with the car seats, you should be like the very last person to turn your kid around in terms of weight based things. So again, that, that's all kind of boring, rote, obvious. I mean, super important. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's, it's super important. But otherwise, and I hope this isn't too, too cliche, but it comes down to uh, quantity over quality. There's no such thing as quality time, just quantity time. And time you spend with your kids, even if it's, uh, you know, even if it's like the fourth assistant coach when you're totally woefully unqualified to be 
uh, assistant coach one through three, but you're there to whatever help with something is, uh, is still a great time. So, uh, that's probably the best uh, parent advice I could give, I suppose. And it doesn't necessarily apply to physicians, providers, anyone else. It's just, uh, do your darndest to get as much time with your kids as you can. So I think that's fantastic advice. I love it. Yo, quantity over quality is like the med peds mantra. So <laughs> I, I think you're, you're, you're earning that honorary med peds degree. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Um, one of the things I love to ask is asking about people's failure, not just because it makes Chris and I feel better about ourselves, but um, because I think it really does a good job of normalizing some of the struggles that are inherent in the, the medical training system and the medical system. And I was hoping to see, could you share a failure that comes to mind, maybe something you've learned from it or a favorite failure if you have one? Yeah, I, I don't want to call, uh, I, I guess we'll call a redirection. But again, I was, you know, I was five years post med school when I decided to become a dermatologist or make make efforts to. So the, the big joke I have is my first dermatology rotation was, in fact, my dermatology residency. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had never actually done a dermatology rotation in med That's school nice. or residency. Now, I was very fortunate that uh, I had served in the Air Force and there's a mechanism by which you can retrain. But actually, there is, there's, that mechanism does exist with maybe about half of all civilian uh, dermatology residencies. I say half because about the other half are kind of indebted to Medicare funded slots. And so it's difficult to retrain um, for about half of residency programs because they would have to pay more salary than they might have access to. But uh, like, for instance, at Wright State, we often are excited to have, you know, previously board certified, you know, family practice, internal medicine, peds, whoever applying. And and that's uh, so. So anyway, I don't want to say mistake, but it's sort of never too late to retrain. And, and again, I'm I'm thrilled with my my career path. I wouldn't have changed my time as a pediatrician. I had four years as an attending and some, a little bit of it at the beginning was uh, inpatient with a little ER. And then most of it was outpatient. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think I still think like a pediatrician and certainly raising my kids and kind of the mindset I had was uh, biased heavily by that. So anyway, I, I hopefully that's not too much of like a humble brag mistake because it definitely was a seven year shift in uh, delay in terms of what I do today. Um, but uh, I think the concept of uh, keeping your mind open to retrain it, or even not even just retrain, just, you know, expand your skill set, uh, even if that doesn't mean another three-year residency. So Absolutely. I mean, we all have different pathways in which we take, and sometimes we don't know that pathway until we've already gone through it. And so, yeah, and I've, you know, and then the same thing with academics, people can be, you know, I was out, gosh, almost 20 years out from med school and decided, you know, this academic side is, is pretty cool and uh, spent kind of five, six years trying to kind of shift my career hmm. to be able to work in academics, which uh, was baby steps and hanging out at grand rounds and helping just like a med student trying to help with things. And now it's worked out to the point where I, you know, have, have a nice trials unit and have a lab and have students. And it's kind of crazy. So it's great. Awesome. That's cool. I think some of the happiest people I know are ones who switched residencies even. I, the first residency, I think they were pretty unhappy, but then, you know, ultimately the obstacle is the way part of the path. Yeah, I got to be careful though. I have, I have plenty of friends and colleagues who might even be <laughs> listening who uh, either trained with me or uh, so. No, no, pizza's great. Had I, had I never gone and done my derm residency, I think I'd be a happy guy. I'd, I'd probably be sitting around reading some derm stuff. Um, but, uh, but you're right. In terms of like you're saying happiest, yeah, it, it is. It has been nice to be able to subspecialize. Great. Our episode today is sponsored by Panacea Financial, a nationwide digital bank built for doctors by doctors. Whether you're a fourth-year med student, a resident, or an attending physician, Panacea Financial is a bank designed specifically for you. Panacea offers free checking with no ATM fees nationwide, 24-7 customer service, and loan options custom-made for physicians or trainees at every career stage. That's perfect, because I hate ATM fees. But tell me more about those loan options, Sam. Board certifications are pretty pricey. They absolutely are. But instead of running up credit card debt, try their PRN personal loan that is designed to give you a better way to cover expenses, such as relocation, board exams, home renovations, or even consolidating high interest debt. Panacea's PRN personal loan is funded in as little as 24 hours with interest rates starting at half of a typical credit card. They understand money can be tight, which is why they offer a period of no or reduced payments on their PRN personal loan. They also support physicians in other ways, including helping you start, expand, or even buy it into a practice or surgery center. And I totally want to buy into a surgery center. Absolutely. If only I was a surgeon. But alas, I'm not. 
But still, if you're ready to join the thousands of doctors who have declared independence from traditional banks, visit PanaceaFinancial.com today to open your free account. Panacea Financial is a division of Primus member FDIC. Uh, perfect timing. Yes. Sydney, uh, welcome. Sydney, if you're up for it, you can you know bring us to our, our first case from Cash Out Children's Hospital. Absolutely. All right. So you are seeing Victor, a 13-year-old with a history of eczema, who is here with his caregiver who is concerned about changes in his skin. Victor tells you he's noticed new asymptomatic light spots appearing on various parts of his body, including his cheeks and arms. On exam, he's well-appearing. He has dark skin with several hypopigmented macules and patches on his face and arms with poorly defined edges. So recognizing that we are going to touch on a variety of different hypopigmented lesions and associated disorders today, can you just talk broadly about your differential diagnosis for hypopigmented lesions? Sure. So, you know, the step back and and those who've, who've read on this or had patients with these conditions are not surprised that we would bring up the concept of hypopigmentation versus depigmentation. So essentially the greater premise of deciding that this is in fact hypopigmented, that is less deeply pigmented than the adjacent skin, but not depigmented, meaning as unpigmented as the whites of the eye. Um, So sort of milky white, that becomes sort of the first uh, kind of algorithmic approach, right? And then the next subset beyond that would be acquired, which in this case for a uh, 13 year old, uh, you know, with the prior history of, uh, you know, with these new developments, you would suspect that these are in fact, uh, you know, acquired. But uh, again, uh, we'll we'll see the same questions or the same concepts. And even if you if you take a look at the same uh, image searches on hypopigmented lesions that are, you know, congenital in nature or depigmented lesions that are congenital in nature versus acquired, you end up with, you know, vastly different uh, differentials. So rather than thinking about, you know, inflammatory dermatoses that are kind of bringing along a little bit of melanocyte injury, you instead get into things like, you know, melanoblast development, the ability to synthesize melanin, the ability to have lysosomal structures that traffic melanin and and then associations, which include like immunodeficiencies and things. So anyway, it very quickly becomes uh, a large differential, even though the most common causes of things like hypopigmentation and depigmentation are relatively common and uh, easy to recognize. The differential actually is pretty broad and goes from all sorts of rare genetic syndromes up to Hansen's disease, leprosy, for instance. So there's just a massive differential that you start to think. And so in approaching like a acquired case as this child who's a adolescent has some eczema, what are some of the first things that kind of help you lend, uh, uh, move towards one of the more common things on a diagnosis. Um, I imagine if you walk into this patient's room at Cash Lack, you wouldn't be thinking leprosy. You know, I, I think I got it. You know, what are some things that you would approach to that would say this is common for something common or these are, you know, w- w- what kind of history are you taking or, you know, what, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. what's the differential you're looking for on the CBC? So the history in this case is certainly giving us a little bit of uh, anchoring, a little bit of, uh, you know, the question stem, if you will, is certainly favoring something in the atopic dermatitis family. And so, of course, pityriasis alba, which is essentially one of the mild phenotypes of eczema. It's actually so mild that it's sort of considered one of the minor diagnostic criteria for developing full-on eczema, uh, meaning a lot of kids who have pityriasis alba, which again is uh, kind of this very brief eczema eruption in which the melanocytes get damaged kind of disproportionately to the rest of the skin, and it leads to just a little bit of hypopigmentation. And, uh, and so the actual preceding eczema is really quite mild, just a little scale, short-lived. And then the Uh, hypopigmentation, especially in the summertime when patients are getting a lot of kind of exogenous ultraviolet light just from living life in the sun. That is, uh, uh, again, the, the hypopigmentation is actually what brings families in for evaluation, it's not that mild, faint rash that in many cases is short is self-limited, meaning it's so mild on the spectrum of eczema that the eczema really doesn't require treatment. It's just the fact that now the kiddos have this post-inflammatory hypopigmentation and that whole clinical condition is called pityriasis alba, very common. 
we also see, uh, you know, a bit more common in the summertime for the same reason where the contrast between normal unaffected skin and clinically affected hypopigmented skin, that contrast becomes larger because of, again, exogenous ultraviolet light, time in the sun, time at the pool, time at the beach. Uh, and so uh, another, you know, condition, uh, tinea versicolor, which is a uh, yeast uh, caused by malesthesia uh, that has this endogenous pigmentation enzyme called azelaic acid. Uh, and azelaic acid kind of bleaches out melanin. And so those two are the most common. Those are uh, incredibly common causes of hypopigmentation. Um, that we think of in a in a scenario like this. And so. when we have this patient, because this is something that's pretty common, you know, we'll see it in the clinic. All often, this is one of those things where Justin's going to say what he does and then uh, have give the expert the opportunity <laughs> to correct them and, and, and teach them what other runs doing. It's like a lot of just reassurance. Um, I feel like we, you know, say that it's benign. But frankly, I don't know too much of when do we – start looking at other things. I mean, it seems like it's, for me, typically pitarisis alba until proven otherwise, which is pretty unique for something that really has no other objective data points other than it's hypopigmentation. And that's like the most common thing I've seen. Yeah, but but there are some things you're noting. So it tends to have, you know, kind of five to 25 millimeter relatively circular annular patches. So it doesn't really trail off. It doesn't have like a net-like pattern. It has a relatively defined pattern that again, as a pediatrician, your visual diagnosis skills are going to rev up just like uh, the occipital lobe of a dermatologist. The same thing's going to happen to the occipital lobe of a pediatrician. Again, I actually don't get too many referrals for pityriasis alba because again, patients are, or uh, you know, in many cases, the pediatrician had um, adeptly told them what uh, what it was, and it's it's not a uh, a major diagnostic question in terms of reassurance versus uh, actual therapy. You know, if they have some comorbid eczema, so they have more than just the pityriasis alba, so they actually have you know some lichenified eczema on their antecubital fossae. They have hyperlinear palms, maybe they're developing uh, hives, or they have you know what we call ichthyosis, and they have other uh, very dry skin on the front of their shins, and you start to put together that, yeah, no, they don't just have pityriasis alba, uh, then you certainly can consider all the typical eczema therapies, which uh, we talked about last year, so emollients and, you know, uh, obviously the old standard 1950s topical steroids, but we have all sorts of newer, uh, fancier topical calcineurin inhibitors and phosphodiesterase inhibitors and, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but again, if you're trying to just treat the pityriasis alba, you can use a lot of those same treatments. Uh, you know, if, if for families that are especially vigilant or if it's widespread, again, if I have them in my clinic and it's it's easier for me because I just have this in my down my hallway, but uh, narrowband ultraviolet light phototherapy, even for kids, it's an effective treatment, sometimes like five treatments uh, over two, two and a half weeks. Uh, and that is going to augment their uh, topicals and, and they'll often do great. So it, in terms of, yes, we usually reassure, but yeah, I mean, there's there's uh, definitely, it can be widespread, severe. You know, sometimes you might have a, a teenager who's especially distressed by it and, and, you know, the treatment of it isn't, isn't particularly challenging. You know, it's an opportunity to try to get them to wear a little more sunscreen. And that, uh, again, a big reason it's a summertime complaint is actually because the rest of their unaffected skin is is tanned a bit more. And then their unaffected skin kind of doesn't tan uh, even in proportion. It's just uh, hypopigmented. So that contrast is why it's most, you know, most obvious. So, so Craig, you know, one one thing I, I worry about is are there are there other differentials that we have to make sure we don't miss and what are some of those red flags because you know that well in terms of don't miss i would say they're younger kids so younger kids if you had a baby there's an entity called hypomelanosis of edo and again it's really not going to look like pityriasis alba to a pediatrician who's seen pityriasis alba because in contrast to these circular annular dime nickel quarter half dollar size circles all over the kids photo distributed face and arms if they instead have hypomelanosis of edo they're going to have this very reticulated what we call blashcoid it'll follow these like jagged edges often stop abruptly at midline it basically follows embryonic cleavage planes the reason why hypomelanosis of edo is important is somewhere around a quarter of those kiddos 
will have uh, associated, whether it's developmental delay, seizures, they can develop glaucoma. So it, it's an X-linked gene that uh, is involved with ectodermal differentiation in general. So the first actual clinical symptom you'll see will be the hypomelanosis of Edo. Uh, but some portion of those kids are going to go on, unfortunately, to have other ectodermal problems, basically involving their central nervous system or their eyes. It's incredibly uncommon. I will tell you as a selection bias in pediatric dermatology, the literature says, you know, about a quarter of these kiddos will have developmental delay, seizures, eye issues. In my practice as a dermatologist, it's much lower than that. But admittedly, that's because kids who have developmental delays, seizures, eye issues, they're not necessarily going to make their way to pedia or to dermatology or pediatric dermatology first. They're going to make their way to developmental specialists, neurologists in ER when they're seizing, uh, an ophthalmologist when they were, they were noted to have a smaller left eye or, or uh, uh, not tracking with one eye and that kind of thing. So that would probably be the most serious of the congenital. And then, of course, uh, tuberous sclerosis uh, will develop hypopigmented, what we call ash leaf macules. Now, they're in many cases one of the more subtle signs. So they are often a Woods lamp evaluation, full body exam of a kid with developmental delay. They're often not. I actually, in 20 years, I can't recall having a family have a chief complaint of a ash leaf macule. Other skin complaints for sure, but I've never diagnosed TS and I diagnose a few a year. We actually have some new topicals to treat the angiofibromas that uh, teenagers develop on their nose with TS. So, so it's pretty cool that there's progress being made in that condition that has a huge range in in uh, severity, but uh, as important as hype, uh, ash leaf macules can be in establishing that diagnosis, it's not usually something, in, in my experience, that that families will independently present for. But again, those would be kind of the uh, congenital things for hypopigmented lesions that you'd at least you know kind of think about. And I would say that they really don't look like pityriasis alba. Um, they they have this more reticulated, jagged edged. Uh, this is where uh, doing an audio <laughs> podcast is uh, more difficult for our listeners. I hope we have a lot of auditory learners who we can we can wax poetic and describe what these would look like. And then and then there's some interesting you know more serious acquired things. I mentioned uh, uh, tuberculid leprosy, uh, actually onchocerciasis, a whole host of vitamin deficiency, selenium deficiency. So for you know severe recalcitrant cases or for patients with exotic travel in their history. There are certainly uh, other things you want to want to think about. There are some rare phenotypes of cutaneous lymphoma, incredibly uncommon in kids. They typically actually have an excellent prognosis. There's uh, what we call hypopigmented mycosis fungoides, which is uh, all sorts of misnomers. It is hypopigmented, but it's not a it's not a mycotic condition. It's not a fungal condition. Uh, but back three, four hundred years ago, they they thought it must be a fungal infection of some kind because the fulminant lymphoma lesions look like mushrooms. So, but again, that's rare in kids. But actually, you know, we do see cutaneous lymphoma in kids occasionally. So, I think that would be the crazy, crazy three, four <laughs> standard deviation differentials that we would think about for hypopigmented MF. Although I would say I've seen almost all of those, including leprosy in teenagers. So that's partly biased by where I trained in Los Angeles, that we had an unbelievable international population and people coming in from all over the world. And, and we actually would uh, have families come in occasionally with known Hansen's disease. And um, it's acquired through close contact. And so we would actually see their uh, children once a year. And every now and then once, uh, one, uh, you know, a kid would develop um, Hansen's disease from one of their parents. It has this unbelievably long incubation period. You can have, be exposed and not develop it for 10 years. And, I think it's, uh, it, it's, this is really helpful. And I think it sounds like a lot of these more uncommon forms of hypopigmentation are ones that have this kind of severe recalcitrant pathway is what I'm hearing, which is which yeah, is reassuring. Usually, usually. One of the, I think, pathologies or I feel like common presentations I'll see, if a patient doesn't necessarily have a history of eczema or I'm a little based on whatever minimal intuition I have as a provider, feel like this is not pityriasis alba and I see a new hypopigmentin lesion, um, often in adolescent, a lot of times this post-inflammatory hypopigmentation or post-inflammatory hypomelanosis pops up to my head. And I admit, I, you know, sometimes fall back on that one. So going back to the world of, you know, Justin's questionable clinical practice, 
when is this something that comes up? And can you talk a little bit about what is post-inflammatory hypopigmentation? Is that something we can kind of use as a uh, all bucket that things drop into and then monitor and if it gets better, we can confirm the diagnosis. And if it doesn't get better, we say it's cutaneous lymphoma and send them to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it may or may not be lymphoma. That's cool. Um, so again, uh, it turns out melanocytes, they're relatively wimpy cells, which is really interesting because when they become cancerous, they're really rotten, right? So so most skin cancer, you know, if you have family members with skin cancer, most of the time skin cancer is like no big deal, except actually melanoma is disastrous, Merkel cell cancer. Yeah, you know, there are a few that are disastrous. Actual lymphoma can be a big deal as well on the skin. So, so these actually wimpy cells that have this kind of crazy uh, malignant potential. It's this kind of weird dichotomy. But basically, you can think of pityriasis alba to a great extent as falling within that concept of post-inflammatory hypomelanosis. If you use liquid nitrogen to freeze a wart, if a uh, kids uh, squeeze a zit too hard, it's not uncommon that you'll see a little rim of hypopigmentation pallor uh, around uh, around it cuts. You know, So if someone is sort of Fitzpatrick- phototype 3 or fair complected. So essentially, if someone is like Hispanic or lighter, then when they have an insult to the skin, they'll typically have post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. It will turn light. They'll get a light spot that slowly fills back in with melanin. If patients are darker complected, so if they're kind of Fitzpatrick 4 or darker, when they have a wound, when they have a cut, when they have a rash, they'll instead have kind of the opposite response where their melanocytes will kind of make extra melanin in response to that uh, insult. So uh, again, there are some underlying complexion differences that can lead to, again, post-inflammatory hypopigmentation versus uh, what we'll see again in, in our more dark complected uh, patients who uh, will have, have dark areas that show up, except for actually the rare disastrously severe skin reaction that can lead to depigmentation in a patient of color. So you could have someone who's very darkly complected, who has like a, a acid burn, a third degree burn, uh, some type of severe insult, and then their skin actually doesn't become hypo or hyperpigmented, but becomes depigmented, becomes frankly depigmented. So we'll see that with, you know, more profound, deeper injuries. Like I said, burns, uh, discoid lupus is a classic skin issue that will lead to depigmentation. So uh, when we think of uh, post-inflammatory hypomelanosis, this is a broad spectrum that can be anything from a, uh, a prior dermatosis to an actual skin insult, such as a burn, uh, up to, you know, a, a cut will often have hypopigmentation around a cut or a last. So it's a broad differential, but uh, yeah, no. Again, I, I I guess I would I would be given the pep talk to pediatricians that again you're used to seeing especially pityriasis alba and these lesions, and if we're having annular circular spots, I, I don't think you need to worry too much about hypopigmented mycosis fungoidy lymphoma or, or tuberculid leprosy. Those are those are incredibly unlikely. But hey, I mean, this <laughs> hey, is a right. podcast. <laughs> You know, we, exactly. We, we, love, we don't want to talk about we don't want to talk no, about pityriasis alba for for a while. We want to talk yeah, the about good stuff. You know, hypopigmented MF. So yeah, exactly. I I maybe have one more question. Then sorry to to both other than Chris and Sydney can um, um jump in. But in um the other presentations, I feel like very common are in newborns, and I don't think that I've missed much hypopigmentation of Edo. Although I will probably stay up tonight thinking about it. Are there common presentations? For a newborn where, again, that clinical practice of Justin, I just often say like, oh, newborn skin is sensitive, like let's keep an eye on it and things get better. When you're seeing some kind of hypopigmentation, you know, on the neck, are you immediately thinking of some of these tinea infections that we've talked about? Are you providing some reassurance that there's some just sensitivity, hypopigmentation? I feel like I see these in newborns, they resolve and, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, th this is fun. So again, a whole uh, we get, we talked for a while on this. So there's a lot of again ethnic variation, which is which is pretty cool. So again, our patients of color when they're born, their melanocytes are usually very quiet. They're quiescent. They just haven't you know exerted their full effect. So uh, especially even even like Fitzpatrick phototype five or six, that's very darkly pigmented. Typically African patients, um, their newborn babies will be several Fitzpatrick shades lighter, just globally. We'll just see lighter complected babies. That's just a difference in how quickly and efficiently the melanocytes are making melanin. 
uh, melanosomes, which are basically vesicles that get distributed across the basal layer, and how densely that melanin is is getting kind of packed onto the epidermis. So, so that would be kind of like you know one little fun interesting topic. Now, in terms of a brand new, you know, hi, we just met this baby, newborn nursery exam, a couple days, ready to go home. We're doing a check that morning on a kiddo before they head home. You know, there is a birthmark called nevus anemicus and nevus uh, depigmentosis, where which will look in general. Uh, hypopigmented before, even though it really, as they get older, becomes depigmented. Uh, so you can actually have a quote unquote birthmark, which represents epidermal mosaicism. And that's, you know, generally pretty static. That's like, okay, here's your kid's cool birthmark. So one of the less common birthmarks. Now you can recognize them from behind at the pool kind of thing. Um, hypopigmentosis of hypomelanosis of Edo that we mentioned really doesn't present until months later. It's really not apparent. Uh, until, you know, gosh, four to six to nine months of age. So it's not something you're going to notice typically in the newborn nursery. And then we kind of fall really into the pityriasis alba when we start to see a lot of that. In fact, our, our vignette uh, from Cashlack Hospital, um, Cashlack needs to find a toy company or something to <laughs> hey. uh, get a sponsorship or something. You we know. need a new name but, then. Um, but anyway, so... <laughs> Yeah, a private equity owned uh, toy company to, uh, but anyway, um, and uh, they, uh, but 13 would actually be a bit old. It's not too old for uh, pityriasis alba, but we would start to see a little less of, of that just in terms of incidence. So. I, I do want to bridge the gap just a little bit to the last recording we did where we were talking about tinea infections and touch briefly. I know we already talked yeah. a little bit about tinea versicolor, but one of the things we talked about is that like it can be helpful, sometimes humbling to do the culture in the first place. In this case, I mean, how often is the di- their diagnostic uncertainty between tinea versicolor, pityriasis alba, and other things? Like, is it helpful to do some of those diagnostic testings, or do you feel like nine times out of 10, it's pretty clinically apparent? Again, oh gosh, I, I don't want to derm splain because I think peds, there's some ped splaining in this too. So I'm going to tell you it's it's visual diagnosis and our pediatricians see plenty of tinea versicolor and pityriasis alba uh, and more severe insults to the skin leading to hypopigmentation and I am meaning cuts and scrapes and things. And so I, I think that, you know, the way we see, uh, so tinea versicolor tends to be very symmetric. Uh, just the amount of sebum that your body makes tends to be symmetric. Some people have very sebaceous chest skin and back skin, and they'll get a lot of tinea versicolor in those areas because the malesthesia yeast just loves that uh, just loves that uh, um, sebum. Other kiddos uh, and teenagers will have a lot more sebum production on their like lateral cheeks. So you'll see the tinea versicolor kind of work its way up on the neck and the cheeks, but it's going to be pretty much always symmetric. And that symmetry is one of the real, you know, key things you can kind of bank on. Now, in terms of doing a culture, yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't even say nine out of 10. I can't think of the last time I actually did a culture on uh, tinea versicolor. When we have med students rotating, we'll do like a KOH or a chlorazal black E, which is kind of a fancier version of uh, KOH and, and do an actual scraping in clinic. And it mostly because it's got this cool uh, baked baked ziti and meatballs look to it, which is kind of cool to see. But most of the time, again, for pityriasis or for uh, tinea versicolor, it really does have very characteristic appearance. Uh, and, and part of it is it's an actual like silhouette pattern recognition because the Versicolor means, yeah, it can be lighter, it can be darker, depending on the patient's complexion, depending on how long it's been going on, probably some differences in how resistant uh, a kiddo's skin is to the effect of the azelaic acid that the malesthesia produces that leads to the bleaching out of the skin. And so I think I I would absolutely trust a pediatrics provider to say this really does look like uh, uh, tinea versicolor and and empiric treatment is is likely warranted. uh, again, uh, Dr. Shugatelli, I, I have, have never been one uh, myself to, to block consults. I was always happy to see people if they had had questions. Um, hopefully everyone's uh, dermatologist that uh, is listening to the curbsiders has a dermatologist who agrees, hopefully. So. I will say our dermatologists are always welcome to see our patients in seven to eight months. In <laughs> <No. laughs> seven to eight months. Well, you know, so yeah, I mean, there's there, but that's actually one of the, so here, here's, here's the, I mean, not, not that I'm speaking for like my entire specialty. I will say though, that our pediatricians take great care of the skin. When I was a pediatrician, I, there are a lot of things I do very similar to what I do today. So three years of residency uh, affected my practice pattern, uh, three years of dermatology 
residency affected my practice pattern in some things. And for some things, it didn't affect it much at all. And in terms of visual diagnosis and pattern recognition, I know for myself and my schedulers know that when a pediatrician has concern, I, I try to get the kids right in. Obviously, I have a bias as a pediatric dermatologist and having having that uh, concern. Yeah, it saddens me if, if not everyone has a, pedi- a pediatric dermatologist down the hall who's happy to see their kids. And I, and I know that that is the case. I have patients who come from a state away, um, sometimes two states away, which is which is kind of crazy. In I, one thing about dermatologists, at each institution I've been, there's always been at least one, although probably more that is willing to receive, you know, the the message of a quick patient summary and a, a photo and a picture. And there's been e- at each institution, a dermatologist who will not only respond, but will respond in like paragraph form with like educational pearls and tips and are so excited to see that I don't know what numular eczema is. And it's just a wonderful resource to, to have. Them. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, it's it's just fun. It's like playing cards. It's like uh, you show me your your best rookie card. And <laughs> I'll show you mine. And I don't know. Dermatology is a lot of fun. I I, uh, I enjoy every day I'm able to see patients. So uh, I hope that most of you have uh, dermatologists who feel that way about your patients as well. So. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, at the the at the cash like state where I come from, we we have an e consult huh. system, and uh, it's fantastic. Uh, and just just take a couple nice. pictures, put in the EMR, put an e consult in, and we have a board certified dermatologist will review the pictures and give us uh, give us a recommendations in the EMR within forty eight hours. So it's been it, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, and, and we collaborate with uh, with that crew. There's uh, we we give lectures over there. They give lectures over to us, and and it's a good time. Wright State and Ohio State, where uh, where his cash lock. Maybe he's not. Yeah, you guys can edit that out. Never mind. Wherever he is, maybe he's an issue. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I love that choice. <laughs> so the one thing that my patients are always asking me when they do have these kind of benign appearing. Uh, hypopigmented lesions is how long until the skin looks normal again? So what sort of advice can we give to patients in those cases? Yeah. So actually kind of a complicated answer. Sorry, I guess that's been the trend with these podcasts with me. Sorry about that. But uh, some of it actually depends on severity, of course. Some of it depends on the time of year. So if if you're diagnosing someone with pityriasis alba in May or June, uh, in North America, you're likely going to have a summer of it being at least somewhat visible, again, because of that large contrast between their unaffected and affected skin. Uh, whereas if you catch someone in September, it's already going to already have improved a bit and it's just going to just keep getting better as the sun goes away for the fall and the winter. Actual treatment, treating it as if uh, you know it was mild eczema with either topical steroids or topical calcineurin inhibitors or uh, emollients will make that a bit faster. And then, you know, again, if you had a kind of a cosmetically sensitive older teenager, you had a reason to, let, let's say, you know, prom photos, you know, whatever, you know, there are all sorts of obscuring agents. There are many different brands without getting into uh, proprietary products, but there are a lot of uh, excellent obscuring agents that can be done as sort of a, a quote unquote band aid while the skin is recovering. But in general, you're probably talking on average on the order of three to eight weeks. Uh, depending on the year, uh, the time of year to, to see kiddos. So it's not uncommon that I'll book follow-up for two to three months and tell patients if they're doing much better or tell families that if their kiddos are doing much better, they're welcome to cancel the appointment and that we'll take care of some other kid instead. And I, and a large portion don't feel the need to come back because their kiddos are, are doing great at that point. Great. Do you want to move on? Uh, yeah. Let's, let's set up the next case. Sydney, you want to bring us into case number two? Absolutely. So changing the case, taking a different case, we, we have a patient, whether it's Victor or someone else, who is presenting with more sharply defined hypopigmented macules around his face and hands and a family history of vitiligo. His caregiver is wondering if this is definitely vitiligo as well and what the next steps might be. Yeah. So uh, actually, just taking a step back, if Victor had both hypopigmented and depigmented uh, things at the same time, we'd actually have to consider, you know, could he have more than one problem? Could he have one unifying diagnosis? I know we keep bringing it up. It's it's almost like a joke, but cutaneous lymphoma is one of the classic things where you'll have multiple morphologies at the same time. So I'll, I'll just mention that since Victor Uh-oh. keeps getting the short end of the stick here when it comes to pigmentation. But but um, again, even when we talk about the, uh, you know, kind of the known family history of vitiligo, that these are, you know, sharply depigmented. Now, if they're truly like depigmented and and just 
you know, bleached out, milky white, the same tone as the whites of Victor's eyes, then vitiligo is likely. But that actually still gets complicated. So, and what I mean is vitiligo can absolutely occur in isolation, but we see it as one of the absolute patterned autoimmune conditions. Uh, there are a few polymorphisms. There's one called NLP, NALP3, uh, which is a gene we don't routinely test for, but it's a polymorphism highly associated with vitiligo. But boy, we also see the more serious uh, autoimmune polyendocrinopathies. Vitiligo is a very common component of that. So some subset of kids who develop vitiligo, 18 months later, they may, they may show up in DKA, uh, or they might actually show up with the opposite, where they now, in the areas that don't have vitiligo, they're having more severe pigmentation because they're actually developing Addison's. We see it, you know, not uncommonly that kids can have hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, more often hypothyroidism develop with a background of vitiligo. And then even the, you know, quite rare in kids is uh, pernicious anemia, B12. But when you see it, it's typically in kids with vitiligo. So vitiligo is one of of those honest to goodness autoimmune conditions that can occur in clusters of other more severe uh, autoimmune problems and especially uh, autoimmune uh, uh, polyendocrinopathies. So again, most of your kids with vitiligo are just going to have vitiligo, but we always are going to screen them at least with a CBC and TSH, especially if there was a strong family history like was reported. If there had been a family history of mucocutaneous uh, candidiasis, there's another autoimmune condition. Uh, it's an ARE gene mutation, AIRE gene mutation, which is uh, again, it would be tested through with genetics, but there's a subset of kids who will develop vitiligo. They'll develop severe candidal nail infections, which looks a little different than typical fungal onychomycosis. The white, the nails almost look like white brittle, like uh, kind of shattering on top of the, uh, kind of like uh, if someone was in a uh, like a windshield that that shattered. That's what the nails will look like as a sign of candidal infections. And they'll actually have thrush. They'll have uh, lateral oral commissure, um, angular colitis, or, and maybe even have, you know, some uh, uh, candidal diaper rash, uh, except they're 16, you know, not wearing diapers. So um, these are all uncommon, but there are some rare associations with vitiligo that even if it's just honest to goodness vitiligo, that in fact, we still need to, you know, at least keep in the back of our mind. Going back to sort of the sort of the case presentation that we have here, we, we say that uh, Victor has got a family history of vitiligo. So you sort of said that vitiligo, you know, you see you might see this association with these other autoimmune diseases. What's sort of the association of familial vitiligo to him or other autoimmune to him? Yeah. So again, uh, we don't routinely test for it like the NALP3 gene. Uh, it would be a classic story like this where multiple family members have vitiligo. Uh, and again, not uncommonly, they would also develop hypothyroidism would be the most common of those associations. And in fact, this is uh, uh, actually your opinion, but actually there's a journal we could probably uh, uh, put in the show notes or whatever too, that that uh, this is one of those little uh, debates we have with our uh, pediatric endocrinologist, that there's some data to suggest that if you have comorbid vitiligo with uh, hypothyroidism, that we actually want to get those kids to have a nice, you know, low TSH. We want to get their uh, synthroid dosed to where they're at 1.5 to like three. We don't want them to just barely make it into the TSH uh, happy zone because it turns out that some of the, you know, Fox P3 T cells that are um, involved with uh, basically cytotoxic reactions to your melanocytes seem to be triggered by the same autoimmune condition that's occurring when you're having subclinical hypothyroidism. So um, that that uh, familial pattern does seem to be relatively strong with vitiligo and hypothyroidism we see. But the other reason we'll see the family history is, again, just because vitiligo is one of those honest-to-goodness autoimmune associations like hypothyroidism that, uh, you know, tends to cluster in families, even if they don't have a specific defined gene. We'll, we'll see that. And I don't, I don't think we have that all figured out why, you know, certain families will have the, we don't always have a gene we can point to for, for those patients. So. And Craig, can we assume it's, you know, similar to autoimmune diseases where it's hereditary in nature and at a certain age, the autoimmune response occurs. Is there a typical age range of presentations for vitiligo? Are there certain triggers, anything like that? 
Yeah, all that. <laughs> so the answer is yes. And, uh, you know, we typically, that the youngest we typically see it is at about maybe three or four or five, but you can definitely see it younger. And then it's quite common in the teens, quite common in the teens and the 20s. And there are all sorts of different like endotypes or phenotypes of presentation. We'll see it uh, just in the genital area, not infrequently. So sometimes there's a long delay in diagnosis because the patient's either embarrassed. And I mean, if you're like 14 and you have depigmented genitalia, you may not actually bring it up to your parents. Um, and so th there may be a long delay in diagnosis uh, before that. And then in terms of triggers for it, yeah, absolutely. Again, the known associations of like of hypothyroidism that I keep bringing up where if someone is actually not euthyroid, it's going to be difficult to treat them. It's going to be difficult to fix them. Our treatments are going to be somewhat plateaued. Uh, there's going to be a ceiling on on just how effective our, our treatments are going to be. But uh, but we'll see vitiligo at later ages. Uh, you know, one of the rare things that you want to think about, fortunately, uncommon in children, is you can absolutely have like a, essentially a reactive vitiligo where, in fact, the trigger to your vitiligo is that you developed uh, melanoma somewhere and that your immune system's efforts to sort of fight off melanoma are leading to uh, vitiligo. So that is one of the fortunately uncommon but known associations. When we see a new patient with vitiligo, we try to do a full skin exam and just make sure that they don't have, you know, kind of a, a funny mole somewhere. Um, you can develop what we call halo Nevi, which is where all your melanocytic moles develop depigmentation halos all around them. And it's actually because your body, in most cases, that's actually a pretty benign phenomenon. Your body is kind of fighting off dysplastic or normal moles. Uh, but unfortunately, the known pattern of, of someone actually having melanoma that their immune system is trying to kind of keep in check, uh, which of course makes sense. We have all these immunotherapies. And, and in fact, if we use immunotherapy for a patient with melanoma and they happen to develop hypopigmentation around all their moles, we're like, sweet, hmm. I bet we got a better chance, you know, here. So, so it's, uh, uh, yeah, there's some, some cool, cool genetic associations from, from that perspective as well. I wanted to quickly revisit. You had mentioned that when you have a patient presenting with likely vitiligo, that you would do a CBC and TSH and then potentially other labs based on clinical suspicion, family history, et cetera. Is that correct? Or are there additional labs you would order? You know, we yeah. like to avoid multiple sticks yeah, on our so. pediatric patients. So, <laughs> Of course. Of course. I, I think a, T, a TSH and a CBC are pretty much the standard of care. Uh, you're good there. As you see them, though, if they started to develop other skin symptoms or started to develop other things that had you concerned that they were developing some of these other, especially endocrinopathies, then, of course, you're going to work them up as needed. But, yeah, the typical new vitiligo patient does not, for instance, need fasting blood sugars on the regular, does not need, you know, uh, testing for Addison's with uh, cortisol levels or, or things to try to decide whether they have uh, blossoming uh, Addison's. At the same time, again, in the internet day and age, this is something at the first diagnosis when I write it down and I have my, on my little handout that I wrote for kiddos with the, or families with vitiligo, I say, yeah, they're, they're probably good, but just be aware. Like I said, this is an honest to goodness. You know, essentially, their white blood cells, their T cells are using their melanocytes as uh, target practice and the, the skin is kind of mm -hmm. coming along for the ride. And that happens in most cases for kind of bad luck, but unfortunately in, in some families can be, you know, the first of many shots fired, so to speak. And so let's say we have a patient where there's a family history, you know, like Victor, or we have multiple patients named Victor. That was just a coincidence. Um, we have, we have Vitalito Victor. We feel pretty confident family history, you know, the depigmentation of the lesions, right? The, our dermatology says they're happy to see him in nine months. Are there things that we can start as far as treatment? Do they need, first of all, do they need a rheumatology referral in addition to dermatology or is it just dermatology? Are there things we can treat or kind of do to prevent the progression or affect the pigmentation of the skin? Yeah, I'm so glad you bring up rheumatology because yeah, it's it takes true. It's a great point. To get into great rheumatology point. where, uh, and I and I absolutely can't get some <laughs> picture back in in two days. But actually, I have lots of great uh, rheumatology friends. In fact. Dr. Chu and I have colleagues and prior residents we both trained who are now 
trusted uh, rheumatology colleagues of ours. So, so m- much love for rheum. In fact, honestly, I have in my network of rheumatologists, I email them, gosh, almost every day uh, with our joint patients and things. So, so I will tell you, vitiligo is not something that rheumatology probably wants or needs to see. That would be uncommon that they would develop a rheumatologic condition uh, in the classic sense. Anything's possible, but that that would actually be unlikely. They would be more likely to see need to see an endocrinologist, and of course, they they certainly right. don't need to see an endocrinologist uh, just in case. I think this is one of those where, again, when I when I send my note back to their primary care physician, uh, their pediatrician, the nurse practitioner who's t- running their care, whoever whoever's taking care of this family, that you know, say here's the diagnosis, these are the labs we've done, they looked great, they didn't. This would be the general guidance for how we manage someone with vitiligo. So in terms of an auto referral and then waiting for empiric treatment, what you can start. Yeah. So you can absolutely use uh, topical corticosteroids. You would know I'm not a dermatologist if uh, if, I, if I didn't at least say that that's an option. And there are different ways to do that. One of the typical options is we'll do it twice a day, Mondays through Fridays. And then on the weekends, we might switch to a hmm. topical calcineurin inhibitor. Or more recently, you could consider, if your patient's a billionaire, uh, you could consider one of the new topical JAK stat inhibitors, which are a bazillion dollars, and there's unfortunately no generics available. So for a guy working at a state-funded med school, it's it's sort of the stuff of dreams for most of my patients, but they are effective. And then you know the big guns, so the two big guns, the two ways that if we are trying to definitively improve the course, the severity, and the natural history of vitiligo. Actually, the three big guns would be fixing any detected hypothyroidism. That, that just means a huge makes a huge difference, and that, that's something a pediatrician could do. The second big gun is uh, narrowband ultraviolet light uh, UVB phototherapy, um, which is incredibly effective. Kind of a strange concept. So essentially, the 1904 Nobel Prize was given for using phototherapy in general for skin diseases. It was mostly used for lymphoma. And there aren't many early 1900s Nobel Prizes that we still use. Most of them have been kind of like you know, we just have better options, you know, but we actually still do phototherapy. Uh, We've perfected it. We have it down to certain single wavelengths. So we use essentially, it's almost like a laser in terms of the uh, narrowness of the band of light that we use. And it basically chases white blood cells out of the skin in a very potent way without the side effects of topical steroids or certainly systemic steroids. And so that that's uh, for families that are willing to come into clinic two to three times a week. The treatments are like five minutes, five, 10 minutes. They're pretty quick and easy. And, and in most cases, they're actually booking an appointment with my phototherapy box, not with me. The worst part about going to a doctor is the <laughs> doctors run late, but our phototherapy boxes are kind of their own thing and they kind of run on time. So it's it's a hassle, but we will do that with kids and teenagers. Again, very effective. And then again, in the stuff of dreams, although hopefully someday the costs come down and so forth, there is a uh, jack stat inhibitor, a systemic jack stat inhibitor, DA approved for our adults with for vitiligo that is uh, not infrequently used off-label in children. In fact, uh, systemic jack stat inhibitors have been used off-label in kids for well over a decade mostly for alopecia areata, that is autoimmune hair loss, that is uh, sort of a cousin of vitiligo. Actually, some kiddos will develop both of those conditions, in fact, and, and by blocking the jack stack pathway, it, it focuses nicely on the specific cytotoxic T cells that are that are a part of uh, the pathophysiology of those and other skin diseases. So that's the, uh, and then like I said, the stuff of dreams, topical jack stat inhibitor, not just systemic, that are effective. Um, off-label, sometimes we'll use use courses of cyclosporin, which can be effective. Generally safe in kids, obviously you're checking lots of labs. We talked about how we try not to stick kids much. Mm. Yeah, that's unfortunately, you know, with, with using meds like that, generally we get mm. away with murder. Kids kids tolerate it well. You have to decide the, you know, severity and the psychosocial impact is if it's sort of worth the treatment for it. But uh, but those are those are sort of off-label options beyond the uh, the big guns of narrowband phototherapy and mm-hmm. the jack stat inhibitors, uh, which, which clearly work pretty well. I have a question about the topical steroids, which it sounds like are no, is not our plan long-term, but is kind of our bridge while we're potentially waiting, alternated ideally with the calcineurin inhibitor. So in terms of potency, are you choosing based on body part or is there something that is more appropriate for vitiligo? And then also for duration of treatment, it makes me very scared to say you're going to use topical steroids every five days a week until eight months from now when you see dermatology. Um, any, any recommendations there? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. So essentially, you are trying to kind of abort the process or put the vitiligo into remission. And it's kind of cool. When the meds work, you'll see kind of two things happen. You'll see kind of a scalloping. You'll see kind of this depigmented circle that starts to scallop around the edges. And you'll see little polka dots of pigment Mm -hmm. in the center of the area and they'll actually be darker patients will be like oh now you've now you've made it worse before i had these light spots now i've got these polka dots in the middle and they're dark and they don't match and that's actually great that's uh, basically uh, pluripotent cells in their follicles that are repopulating the skin with melanocytes and that's what winning looks like so again Depending on the part of the body, depending on the age of the kid, depending on the severity, we will do the regimen I talked about. But then if as they start to improve, we'll flip it where we'll potentially do a topical calcineurin inhibitor for the uh, Monday through Friday and then do a topical steroid on the weekends. You could also start with that routine at the beginning, especially for a younger kid in a thin skinned area. You could, like I said, do the weekend topical steroid, something low potency class, you know, seven or six or five. Um, There are numerous generic topical steroids in those low, relatively safe classes that you could do on weekends. And then on weekdays, do one of the topical calcineurins, pimicrolimus or tacrolimus twice a day. That's kind of a regimen we've been doing for well over 20 years, you know, before we had access to the uh, JAK stat inhibitors that, uh, like I said, have become FDA approved now for this use. So, So Finally, we just wanted to take a moment to ask about some of the more rare causes of hypopigmentation and depigmentation that you would say all pediatric providers should be aware of. Yeah, I just think having it on your radar, especially if you had a kiddo with fair to thrive, vision issues, certainly uh, uncommon or difficult to treat uh, infections, that the differential for the... uh, We we had actually kind of covered the hypopigmented differential uh, earlier, but the depigmented differential... Um, you know, we there, there's some really interesting, uh, you know, pathophysiology behind it, essentially arising from being unable to make melanosomes. And that's one people may remember called Wardenbergs, and they can be associated with hearing loss. And then you can make the melanoblasts, which are the precursors to, um, to the uh, melanocytes, but they can't get to sort of where they're supposed to go. They can't migrate to where they're supposed to go. And that's a condition called piebaldism, which some people have thought we should potentially rename because that's actually the term we use for puppies who have white spots. Um, so I don't know if it's like the most... I've never heard an alternate name, but it's it's a term we use for pigmentation in puppies often, and so using it for kids is probably not perfect. And then the melanocytes are working okay, but you just can't make melanin. There are a bunch of well-known genes that are, uh, again, the melanocytes are ready to go, but you just can't can't make melanin, and that causes that oculocutaneous albinism uh, conditions, which are you know a problem both with obviously their depigmented skin, which puts them at risk for burns, and then eventually for skin cancers, including very severe skin cancers. We can have teenagers who develop skin cancers and even fatal skin cancers for the most severe forms of albinism, and then those kids can obviously have significant vision issues with uh, uh, near near blindness and nystagmus that affects their vision because their retina just basically doesn't have, you have to bring an opt- ophthalmologist in to uh, mm-hmm. you know, be a little snobbier, but the same melanocytes that are uh, involved with giving us our complexion are involved with kind of the view screen on the back of our eyes and the retina. And if that it doesn't, uh, if they don't lay down the correct amount of melanin, then the kiddos have uh, very low vision. And that's, that's unfortunately one of the biggest problems with oculocutaneous oh. albinisms. And then, like I said, they uh, we watch them every year. And then once they hit about 8, 9, 10 years of age, then we really watch them. Then, unfortunately, they really have to be photoprotected. They have to really uh, be, uh, you know, vampire level photoprotected because they'll develop squamous cell cancer or melanoma when they're 14 or 17 years of age with potentially a much higher or much worse prognosis. And then you can have your melanocytes get to the right place. You're able to make melanin, but 
melanin travels actually in lysosomes. And so you can have problems with these lysosomes moving. They're not going where they're supposed to go. And now we'll get into concepts that I think a lot of us will have remembered from boards or from, from our earlier studies. So then we get into the Sheria Kagashi. I can visualize this step one page right now. I like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the Sheria Kagashi, the mnemonic I remember is they have a whole list of problems. It was the LYST gene. <laughs> and they basically can't traffic their melanosomes and their lysosomes correctly. And so they bleeding dysfunction, they have platelet dysfunction, they have immunodeficiency. And it turns out they're very fair complected. They have silvery hair. And then uh, there's one called Hermonsky Public, uh, far more common in uh, Puerto Rico. And there's a little bit of like a founder effect with Puerto Rico. They actually get kind of an acquired inflammatory, well, it's genetic, so, but they get a uh, kind of inflammatory bowel disease with it along with immunodeficiency. And again, the depigmentation, the beautiful silvery white hair. So if you actually have a kiddo with albinism, the, you know, they're born depigmented. Um, there's a, a workup that's done. Some of it is obvious if they have ocular findings. Um, some of it can uh, be useful just on a peripheral smear. But then there are some other more extensive tests that can be done looking at uh, looking for associated uh, disorders. There are some rare ones I didn't get into, one called Griselli syndrome and l So uh, again, these are all pretty uncommon. Actually, ocular cutaneous albinism isn't all that rare. But uh, most of these others are pretty rare, but you just don't want to miss them because those act, those kids can actually show up with, you know, severe life-threatening infections that you'd want to have them, you know, maintain vigilance for. Obviously treated very differently than vitiligo, uh, treated very differently than uh, hypomelanosis or uh, uh, pityriasis alba. I, I tend, once I recognize that it's a lysosomal genetic abnormality, around that time I start thinking about pulling the, the consult button, so... Good for you. Um, truly, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, I'll start with absolutely. a steroid. Absolutely. I, I'll still start with a steroid. So. <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> this has been great. I think we have really gotten the full spectrum of very benign pityriasis alba to multiple references <laughs> to our cutaneous lymphoma, which I think has been very, one, I think reassuring that some of these more uncommon are truly uncommon presentations, but also really kind of seeing that the depth and I uh, have an even greater appreciation now, I think, for the field of dermatology and the dermatologists that practice. For all of our listeners who range from training level, but typically general pediatrics, what do you think some of the main take-home points are going back to that first patient with hypopigmentation? What are some of the big take-home points for this topic? Yeah, well, you, you were very complimentary to my specialty. So I would be very complimentary to pediatrics, which has been a theme of this whole episode that uh, if, if what you, you know, if this looks different than the last 15 kids with pityriasis alba to you, you know, please feel free to refer on. If there are associations, whether they're endocrinologic associations, prior genetic, uh, family history issues, again, uh, things we talked about, you know, nystagmus or uh, concern for um, developmental delay or, or unusual infections, then, you know, that differential obviously needs to, needs to be broadened and a pediatric dermatologist is likely to you know, be able to uh, help you with that. And that, uh, yeah, I would also say, you know, uh, these, especially vitiligo, we're having a lot of progress in the field. As much as I was, you know, decrying the cost of some of these medicines, they will hopefully become less expensive over time. And some of those, especially jack stat inhibitors, they're getting at the pathophysiology. I mean, there, there's, as much as I, uh, you know, decry the cost, I do wonder if in 10, 15 years, we look back at the kind of the first, whatever, two thirds of my career, the first 20 some years I've been in practice. And boy, we were throwing a lot of topical steroids on stuff. <laughs> what, what barbarians we were that uh, as we have access to hopefully less expensive, more targeted therapies, which many of these new, unfortunately, very expensive proprietary medicines represent, uh, that that, uh, you know, uh, becomes uh, something a little more, um, you know, obtainable. And so there's, uh, there's hope for some nice progress in these, in these conditions. So. I like the comment on the visual pattern recognition, and it makes me feel far less self-conscious about doing a dermatology referral for something like pityriasis alba, but looks kind of funny, because um, that seems now <laughs> yeah, more and course. more like that's yeah. actually a, a really great consult for the, the yes. broad list of... Yeah, well, uh, pa patients will ask, well, how do you know? And maybe I'll show pictures from 
website or patients I have from elsewhere, places I'm able to show pictures of things. But I say at the end of the day, my specialty, that of dermatology, and to a great extent, many visual specialties such as pathology or radiology, and again, somewhat with pediatrics, excuse, excuse me, is that if you lined up you know, 100 people in a room and they were the same height and the same hair color as your significant other, and one of them was your husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. And, and then it was 99 people who had the same height, same hair color, same eye color. It would take you about one second to find your your significant other along those other 99 people. Whereas uh, even, even though I'm, you know, some smart dermatologist, not knowing who that one, uh, you know, not knowing the features of your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, it would take me a week to figure out which one it was, right? And so that's very much the skill set. That is the, uh, you know, when a radiologist notices, uh, you know, lack of companion shadows and they say, oh gosh, you know, maybe this is, you know, lymphoma in this kid's chest or they uh, notice something on a chest x-ray, it's because they're used to looking at those, you know, their girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, husband in the, in the midst of, you know, 99 other people and, and figuring that out. So, so in my, you know, our brains are actually built to see, they're built to, uh, you know, have pattern recognition and, you know, pediatricians should actually have a lot of confidence in that. And I'll, I'll tell you myself, and I guess you know, she would tell you I'm kind of a nice guy, but, but if someone refers something in it turns out that no, it was quote unquote just that. It doesn't mean I wasn't able to help take care of that patient, and that, that that's fine. That, that there's value in that. I, I'm always perfectly happy to see you know pitoriasis alba, even if someone thought it was something else, and it was you know it's no there's no such thing as sort of just that. So my uh, pattern recognition metaphor would be talking to the other 99 people lined up, giving some small talk story. Um, she she would be very easy to identify. Um, this is wonderful. I love it. Um, I love and, it. you know, maybe to, to wrap things up, anything that you would like to plug, anything that we should send our listeners to go check out? You know, last time you uh, asked me and I said just, you know, any clinical research, whether that is supporting clinical research efforts for your patient. So, you know, since since we last spoke, I, I was promoted where I'm in charge now of my clinical trials unit, which is which is kind of a cool and nice promotion. And again, I'm, I work at a state med school, so I never profit by any of the clinical trials that we have for kids. Um, but it's actually harder to obviously do trials in kids. We they're, they're a vulnerable population. We need to take really good care of them. The FDA requires us to take you know really good care of them. But uh, for uh, their referring primary care providers, support the concept of it. And again, I actually I have just in terms of my subspecialty practice, I have kids who are who have you know I have a kiddo who has a mucopolysaccharidosis who's in a new clinical trial for the uh, iteronidase that goes into the, through the blood brain barrier. And I have actually nothing to do with that trial totally different institution or whatever, but it's always great for me to see how they're doing and, oh, have you, has the kiddo been unblinded yet? Do we know if they're on the real thing? You know, and, and so I just think, you know, support of clinical research for our kids. I and mean, I'll say that as a guy who really doesn't have a financial conflict of interest um, is, is just a valuable thing for our specialty of pediatrics to have more, more arrows in our quiver to help kind of all our kids. So uh, probably a little bit of a duplicate plug, but with a little more focus, I guess, today. So. Love it. Excellent. Well, Craig, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your expertise. Um, I feel equipped to go uh, uh, tackle children that have hypopigmentation on their skin. Just tackle them to the ground. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe Um, not tackle them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Thanks thanks for... Well, then they'll get some post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. There we go. Bruises. And, uh, you know, where you, where they get a scrape. Full so circle. Full so. annular circle. Uh, great. Cool. Uh, thank you again. Yes, thank Thanks you. for coming back on. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys ever, you know, in a year or two or whatever, you find something you want, uh, feel free to bug me. I have, I have no problem doing this. This is, I, I get a couple emails uh, from people who were listening in and it's like, hey, that's cool. I was, I was happy that I could, could help. That's people. how we know it's so, working. It's a good time. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully. Exactly. I, I'm sure your other guests have said that. They're like, oh, oh, it published. Okay, there we go. I'll go listen to it. This has been another episode of The Cripsiders. It's for the kids. Get show notes and sign up for our weekly Knowledge Food Formula Feeds newsletter on our website at www.thecripsiders.com. We're committed to providing you with high-value practice changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts, or send us an email at thecripsiders at gmail.com and let us know any of your thoughts. A special thanks to our producer for this episode, Sydney Angel, and our showrunner, Dr. Sam Mazur, our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Check it out. I've been Justin Lee Burke. This has been Sydney Angel. And this has been Chris the Chumanchu. Thank you. Good night. See y'all. 
Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode.